Bible. You live in a world where everyone has an opinion about the Bible. Of what values are your beliefs if they are not clearly found in the pages of your Bible? The question we must ask is, are your opinions and beliefs really found in the Bible? Well, welcome. I'm David Freeman with Is That Really in the Bible? Is there more to salvation than just receiving eternal life? Is there more to salvation than just receiving eternal life? I mean, I think everybody wants eternal life. I mean, maybe there are a few who do not. But I guess what I'm looking at is from God's perspective as far as sending His Son Christ Jesus into the world to die for our sins, was it more to it than just, or is it more to it than just receiving eternal life? In other words, what is God's agenda? What is God's purpose here? Now we read in John 3 and verse 15, it does say that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Did Jesus believed that there was more to salvation than just receiving eternal life. Let me illustrate what I'm trying, the point I'm trying to get across here. If I had a pill that would grant people eternal life, in other words, all you got to do is just swallow this pill and it will give you, you know, a new body, it will give you eternal life. All you got to do is take this pill and you will live forever. And let's suppose I went to an old folks home and I said, look, this pill will give you eternal life. All you got to do is just take it. You'll feel better than you've ever felt in your entire life. You'll have energy, you know, exuding from yourself. You'll, you'll, you'll love life, eternal life. You'll live forever. How many do you suppose would say, oh, no, thank you. I'm not interested in that. I just want to live out my few months I ha have here on planet earth, I'll kick the bucket and that's it. I'm not interested in what you're offering. I don't want the pill. No, no. What I'm trying to illustrate is, is a simple fact. We all want eternal life, do we not? We all want to live forever. And that's why I'm asking the question. From God's perspective, from Jesus Christ's perspective himself, is there more to salvation than just eternal life. You know, and if what I see out there, you would almost get the impression that, well, all it's about is just eternal life and all it takes is, yes, I accept Jesus into my heart. You know, all eyes closed, all heads bowed. Now, if you accept Jesus into your life, raise your hand. No embarrassment, no public announcement. No, just raise your hand while all eyes are closed and all heads are bowed. And presto, change you've got eternal life. Again, is there more to salvation than just receiving eternal life? Did you know that getting people saved is easy? I mean, really, it's easy. I mean, all you got to do is just, you know, get you, go buy you one of these big old tents revival tents, you know, and come up with a message. It, it doesn't have to be much, just a simplistic message. You sort of pull on the heartstrings. You sort of make people feel guilty, you know, and then just ask them. You know, you got some music. You got in some inspirational music. And when the music is flowing and you got your message going, you invite people to invite Jesus into their lives. And you've just saved a hundred people, right? Hmm. Well, think about that. You know, because basically what you're talking about is getting people to accept eternal life. That's easy. That's the easiest thing in the world. It would be like getting a hungry person to take a Krispy Kreme donut. You know, you got this bum on the street. He's starving. You offer him a Krispy Kreme donut. Well, of course he's going to take it. Everybody wants eternal life, do they not? Getting people saved is easy. Now, let me tell you the difficult part. Getting people saved is easy, by the way. Here's the hard part. Getting people lost is next to impossible. In fact, 
the truth of the matter is, it's only something God can do. That is, if he calls you, if he opens up your mind, if he gives you the conviction, and that's a big if, if he gives you the conviction that you are truly lost in your sins. You see? So getting people lost is the difficult, is the challenge. Now, notice Matthew 18 and verse 11. It says this, The Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Again, why did Jesus come? To save those who are lost. You see, it's a little bit more to it than just the desire to live forever. And that's why I asked the question, is there more to eternal salvation than just eternal life? And you know, a counterfeit salvation, and listen to me, there is such a thing as a counterfeit salvation out there. Believe me, that message is preached day and night, the one that offers a counterfeit salvation. And you see, the counterfeit salvation deals with this one issue, eternal life. That's all it deals with. And it is a counterfeit salvation. Because, hey, tell me something I don't know. Tell us something that we don't already know. That everybody, you know, when they finally get down to the, to the, you know, the end there, everybody wants eternal life. And that, just offering that part is a counterfeit salvation. In Luke 5 and verse 31, I want to look at that. It says, Jesus says something about the kind of people he is trying, he is attracted to. He said, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Notice this. Jesus comes along and he says, look, I'm not out after the, the wealthy, the wise, the ones who are, that got their life together. I'm after the sick people of the world. And he continues on and he says, I, I came not, verse 32, to call the righteous but the sinner to repentance. Notice this. I have not come to call the righteous. Now let me tell you something you can do. You can take that word righteous and just switch it to religious. I have not come to call the religious. I have come to call the sinner to repentance. You see, religious people, where are religious people at? Well, they're in church. And Jesus comes along and he tells us this fascinating truth. He says, those people are out of, the, out of the loop. I didn't come to call them. I come to call the, the sinner to repentance. Well, where, where might we find some sinners at? Well, probably maybe a drug-infested crack house a prostitution ring, you know, an AA group or a bunch of alcoholics are trying to, you know, the addict, the person who's addicted to something. That's the kind of people that God deals with. That's the kind of people that God calls. I have not come to call the religious, the righteous, but the sinner to repentance. God's not working, this will blow your mind, God's not working with religious people. I mean, that's basically a reality I understand clearly. God's not working with religious people. You know, the book of Revelation talks about God. He says, I will spew you out. I will spit you out of my mouth. And he's speaking to, you know, the churches. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Well, he's not only has he spit us out of his mouth, the spit is drying on the sidewalk. He sort of just washed his hands of the religious type. You know, I tell you, and I can clearly understand that. God's not working with religious people. I haven't come to call the righteous, but the sinner to repentance. God is in the business of getting people lost. And there is no such thing as real salvation until one is first lost. Get that. There is no such thing as real salvation until one is first lost. Now, how might God go about getting you lost? Well, it's very simplistic. He might allow you to serve that addiction for about 20 years. I mean, really, I mean, God knows what's going on. That addiction, that thing you can't quit, that thing you can't give up, he may allow you to serve that for about 20 years. He may allow you to go through about five divorce. I mean, that to me is a pretty lost person, a person who can't figure out how to make a relationship work, you know. 
such a blessing that God has given us, you know, male and female, you know, that, that's sort of loss to me. In other words, loss means this. It means that you have exhausted all human solutions. That's what it means to be lost. You have exhausted all human solutions, A to Z, and you have nowhere else to turn but to God. You see, that's what it means to be truly lost. And I'm saying very few people probably ever come to this, unless God is working with them, unless God is working with them. Now, just what do you mean lost? Now, just what do you mean lost? Well, let me illustrate it. I'm talking about being lost to a will, your will, that cannot do what you would like it to do. Being lost to a will, that is our will, that will not do what we want it to do. That's what it means to be lost. And, you know, only the lost understands this. Religious people don't understand this. Religious people don't understand well, what it means to be lost. That is lost to a will that cannot, I cannot bring it about to do what I desire for it to do. That's what it means to be lost. Romans 8 and verse 7 says this. It says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Get this. The carnal mind just means the natural way we come into this world. Okay, the natural way we all come into this world, in fact, we're all lost. We just don't know it yet. But the natural way we come into the world is with a carnal mind. Now, this carnal mind, the Bible says this, it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. That is, your will cannot comply, is not subject to the law of God. It rejects God's law. It rejects that which is right. In other words, you cannot get it to do the right thing. That's what it means to be lost. The carnal mind, the natural mind, cannot be subject to the law of God. Cannot. And that's why when I see people, you know, arguing about the law of God, and, well, we're not under the law of God, and, and you know, they, they use all of these flippant, excuses about, well, we're just under grace, and we're not under the law. And I even hear preachers preaching this, well, we're not under the law, you know. And I realize that their carnal mind has never been sub brought to that point of submission to the law of God. Because the law of God is what is right. It's the Ten Commandments. It's what, it's what makes our lives work. And we screw up our lives by breaking God's law, the very thing that would make our life work, that's where we get lost at, the breaking of God's law. Sin is the breaking of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. So you're lost to a will that cannot and will not submit to God's. And again, only lost sinners acknowledge this. Religious people, it will be a hot day in hell when they finally acknowledge this, that they are lost to a will that cannot submit to, to the will of God and will not. The natural mind is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Now, I, I think most religious people look at it as, you know, well, you know, they wouldn't look at it like this, that their will cannot submit to the will of God. You know, they would say, well, like, I'm a pretty good person. You know, I'm pretty good and and, uh, you know, me and God, we got it, we're, we're like this. We're two peas in a pod, you know, we're, we're pretty good, you know. I, I know the Lord, and I know, you know, I'm, I'm going to heaven when I die. I'm a good person, you know, you know. Most religious people will not tell you, would not tell you that they, no, most religious people would tell you that they keep the law of God. That's how deceived they are, you know. They, oh, I, I, yeah, I keep the law of God. I, psh, I, I've taken care of that a long time ago. Yeah, I keep the law of God. I'll never forget the time we were at a restaurant. We were riding motorcycles, and actually there was a religious type there, and uh, he actually has got long hair, and he plays Jesus at Christmas time. He looks like a sort of like a hippie, vagabond type of looking guy, but long hair, and for some reason there's this illusion that Jesus had this long hair. He looked like a, a hippie from, from Woodstock or something like that. I don't know why people think that, but, but that's the illusion in people's minds. You know, religious confusion, it's out there, believe me. Well, this guy... Uh, was a religious type, and, and uh, 
he made a com we were eating our meal and he made a comment about a female that was the most vulgar and vile statement I have I, I, I haven't you know I haven't heard that kind of language in quite a long time and the rest of us guys were sort of our mouths dropped down we could not believe what we'd just heard and <laughs> there was another guy there a real clever guy and he said and what church do you go to <laughs> and this guy who had made the vulgar statement actually answers the question, oh, I go to the first something, something church, you know. It went totally over his head that the guy was, you know, <laughs> that he was being humiliated, insulted, because here's this guy, you know, talking this vulgar filth, and the guy says, hey, oh, and what church do you go to? And uh, anyway, it, it was hilarious, but it just goes to prove that most people, most religious people view themselves as Oh, yeah, I, I keep the law. Uh, yes, oh, I keep the Ten Commandments. I've, I've been doing that all my life, keeping I'm a good person. Did you know that they said that, that Steve Gallagher has a ministry, Pure Life Ministry. He said that 50% of Christian men admit being addicted to some kind of porn addiction on the Internet. 50% of men who claim to be Christian are addicted to pornography on the internet. What I'm saying is, if you were to ask these men, do you keep the law of God? Oh yes, I, I keep the law of God. Oh yeah, yeah. You see, that's the deception. Some, some reason we're just sort of, it's an illusion in our minds that, you know, oh yeah, I, I keep the law of God. Now, what do you mean lost? Just what do you mean lost? Lost means you have exhausted all human solutions, A to Z. That's what lost means. So what's a lost person supposed to do? If you're lost, you're lost to, you know, you've exhausted all human solution. What's a lost person supposed to do? Well, I want to offer you something here, two free booklets. I don't have the other one, but I'll send that to you. Should you be baptized and why you need the Holy Spirit of God? You know, baptism if, if what I am saying, you know, about being lost, exhausting all human solution, if that stirs certain heartstrings inside of you, what have you got to lose by ordering this? What do you got to lose? Should you be baptized? Because should you be baptized? Because that is the first step. Baptism represents a watery grave, and it is the burial of the old man. In other words, what you bury is not only your sins, but you bury all of your human solutions that you've tried, A to Z. You bury those also in the waters of baptism. You know, I'm, I'm not asking you to join a church. Uh, you know, I'm just asking you to order this material and see what it says. Take your Bible, take this booklet, should you be baptized, go through each scripture, and come to your own conclusion about what you need to do in your personal life if you are truly lost. You know, churchianity, what I call churchianity, has all kinds of answers out there. And, you know, a lot of those answers are way too simplistic. Well, just give your heart to the Lord. Well, just join the church of your choice. Well, just, just, just say you believe in Jesus. You know, I'm, I, right now, I'm not asking you to do any of that. I'm asking you, get this material, should you be baptized, and study it for yourself between you and God. Romans 6 and verse 1 says this, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And you know, out there in what I call churchianity, there's a lot of teaching that sort of almost would lead you to believe, well, yeah, I guess that's what I'm supposed to do. I'll just continue in sin, and I just trust God's grace, and, and uh, you know, I just, I just continue in sin that grace may abound, you know. Well, let's notice verse 2 and see what Paul said. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You know, how do I become dead to sin? Well, the step is, the first step is accepting Christ as your personal Savior and going down in the waters of baptism, which represents being buried and coming up a new man. 
Romans 6 and verse 3 says, Know you not that so many of us, were, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also should we walk in newness of life. You come up out of this watery grave to walk in a new way of life. Not the old way. You know, the old way didn't work, did it? No, you come up to walk in a new way of life. Romans 6 and verse 6, knowing this, that the old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. Notice that. The body of sin might be destroyed, and, and that henceforth we should not serve sin. Yeah, that's right. That, that's God's purpose. That's God's will. That's the part where there's more to salvation than just receiving eternal life, that we should surrender to God in unconditional surrender, accept Christ as our personal Savior, and be baptized and no longer serve the thing that was destroying our life, that is sin, where we exhausted all of our human solutions and nothing seemed to work. We don't want to go back into that. Romans 6 and verse 14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. How many times have I heard that one? We're not under the law, but we're under grace. What does that mean? Well, it means you're not under the penalty of the law no longer. Once you accept Christ as your personal Savior, the death penalty does not hang over your head anymore. That's what it means not to be under the law. It means the death sentence no longer claims your life. There is no condemnation to those that are in Christ. Okay, that's what it means not to be. Now, Paul anticipated churchianity's response. Oh, praise Jesus, we're not under the law anymore. The law's been nailed to the cross. Notice what he says next verse, Romans 6 and verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? God forbid. There's Paul's answer. Now, I don't know what churchianity's answer is, but, but here's Paul's answer. Shall we continue uh, sin, shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Notice verse 16. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. You see, before you didn't have a choice. Back when you exhausted all of your human solutions, the only choice that you were making was to be a slave to sin. Now, once you have surrendered your will to God's will and you receive the Holy Spirit of God, now you can make the right choices to walk away from that thing that was destroying your life, to walk away from that lost condition that you were in. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be easy. There's still temptations out there. But now you have an added power called the Holy Spirit of God that enables one, if he stays close to God, to live the Christian life, to avoid those things that was destroying your life before. Okay. So what's a lost person supposed to do? Well, I'm going to tell you something that no other preacher will tell you. Um, and this is going to be tough to say this, <clears throat> because... It almost sounds blasphemy. Here, here, here's what I want to tell you. Don't, you know, if you are lost and you feel like, okay, I need to do something with my life. I need to get this material. Should I be baptized and how to receive the Spirit of God? I'm going to give you a bit of advice here. Don't get on the merry-go-round of what I call the religious experience express. You know, I used to have a train track, you know, and this, this train I'm talking about is the Religious Experience Express, and it just went around in circles. It never went anywhere, it just went around in circles, you know. A little kid, I played with my little toy train track and uh, put my trains on there. It just went around in circles. Now, what I'm saying is don't get on, right now, for right now, don't get on the Religious Experience Express. Well, what is that? Well, it's uh, church services, singing in the choir, potlucks, praise and worship music, uh, revival meetings, religious conferences, uh, bake sales, prayer meetings. Uh, you know, the religious experience expressed. Let me, let, me, let me give you some advice here. 
Are you looking for another full-time job? You're, you've already got a busy life as it is. Are you looking for another full-time job? Well, you see, a lot of people get on what I call the Religious Experience Express, and what they actually get is another full-time job to take care of. I'm saying, don't go there yet. Don't, don't get on the merry-go-round of the Religious Experience Express. Get this material, order it. What I'm saying is, you know, in other words, this, that's not where you start. You may one day go to God's church. I didn't say choose the church of your choice. I said you may one day end up in God's church. The Bible does say, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. Uh, <clears throat> you need that encouragement. But I'd like to tell you where a lot of God's churches are. It's in people's homes. It's in home fellowship groups. Remember what Jesus said? He said, I haven't come to call the religious the righteous. Well, where do you find the religious and the righteous? Well, you find them in those big church buildings out there that you see on every street corner. That's where you find them at. Jesus said, I haven't come to call them. I, I didn't come to call those people. They're the religious. They're the righteous. They're out of the loop. I've come to call the sinner who is lost. You see, what I want you to understand, I want you to get this material Study it for yourself with your own Bible. And realize there's nothing between you and God. There's nothing between you and God. You don't need a minister. You don't need a pope. You don't need anything between you and God. There's nothing between you and God but a personal relationship that will change your life forever. And for right now, that's all you need. And that's where, where it begins. That's where it all begins with that personal relationship with God. And that's what's really in your Bible. Is it possible for you to change a desire that you know is wrong? Is it even possible to change the man or woman in the mirror? And if so, how? Are we simply stuck with our emotions, feelings, bad habits, with no hope of ever rising above them? Your Bible says God gives His Holy Spirit to them that obey Him, which means change is possible. Learn the step-by-step -step process for receiving the Spirit of God. Order your two free magazines, Why You Need the Spirit of God and Should You Be Baptized. Having the Spirit of God makes the impossible possible. Order by writing to Church of God, Rocky Mount, 27 Brookledge Lane, Rocky Mount, Virginia, 24151. That's Church of God, Rocky Mount, 27 Brookledge Lane, Rocky Mount, Virginia, 24151. Also, check us out on the web at isthatreallyinthebible.com.